Hello, and thanks for joining today's session in LHSN's Safer Care Accelerator webinar series. My name is Dee Dee Thompson, and I'm a policy fellow here at Imperial College's Institute for Global Health Innovation, and I lead on the LHSN program, which is a joint initiative with the World Innovation Summit for Health. We're very pleased to be joined by Dr. Wakar Azim from Sidra Medical and Research Center in Doha, and he'll be discussing his work and experience on reducing the use of restraints and seclusions in the mental health setting. Uh, Dr. Azim is the inaugural chair of the Department of Psychiatry at SIDRA and uh, Weill Cornell Medical College, Qatar. He'll play an integral role in improving mental health services for children and families in, in Qatar as well as the wider region. His primary research interests include autism spectrum disorder, child and adolescent psychiatry training, global mental health, and innovative ways in reducing restraints and seclusions in inpatient child and adolescent settings, which will be the, uh, the discussion for today. Dr. Azim is also, among his many other roles, uh, currently the chair of the National Autism Working Group in Qatar, which is charged with uh, preparing the National Autism Plan. So now, without further ado, I will go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Azim. So first of all, thank you, Didi, for the introduction. And I'm very thankful to Imperial College and WISH for uh, putting this forum together. It's very exciting. I'm doing it for the first time. And to my knowledge, at least uh, three, con three or four continents are online. So that's even more exciting. And I know from my discussions previously in international meetings that it's a huge issue in a lot of different countries. So I thought this is a very relevant topic. And since I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist, I'll be talking regarding my experience uh, in child and adolescent inpatient settings. But of course, a lot of these principles are very applicable to prevention and reduction of restraints and exclusions in adult mental health settings. So I will go through a few things and uh, probably do a presentation for about 45 minutes. And then we can have uh, some conversations, questions and answers. And uh, at the end of uh, this presentation, of course, uh, Didi has my contact information. Uh, I'll be happy to help or discuss uh, anything I can do for any place in the future. And we'll forward especially the three papers I wrote on this particular topic and my experiences and different studies to share with all the participants. So uh, just to start, uh, I believe folks who are attending this uh, presentation have an idea what are restraint and exclusion, but I will still say just briefly, so how we divide exclusion, the involuntary confinement of a person in a room where they're physically prevented from leaving or believe they are. So I. So I think the word believe they are is important because exclusion is also the term used even when the door of the room is still open, but you might be blocking the door and the person believes they don't have a choice to come out. Restraint, a manual method or mechanical device, material or equipment attached or adjacent to a person's body that is not easily removed and that restricts the person's freedom or normal access to one's body. So that is uh, some uh, definition especially used in the United States. Uh, I think uh, most of you know probably that this issue uh, came to limelight around 1997, 1998 and how it started. So I will just uh, talk briefly about Joint Commission which is a regulatory agency in the United States which did a review in 1998 on 20 deaths, uh, all which required restraints. And the review included one-third children, one-third adults, and one-third geriatric population. It was found that 40% of deaths uh, during those restraints happened because of asphyxiation, especially all the children died in therapeutic physical course. On the root cause analysis for joint commission, uh, what were the main reasons? That it was inadequate assessment, inadequate care planning when the child or adolescent was admitted or the adult uh, patient was admitted. Restraint used as a punishment, not uh, for safety reasons. Inappropriate room or unit assignments, lack of patient observation procedures and practices, 
and staff issues in training. Some more uh, things which were part of root cause analysis, staffing levels that were inadequate, staff competency problems, equipment failure, like the, if the mechanical restraints used were not used properly, absence of monitoring or use of ones that were defective. So what uh, they recommended, Joint Commission, and keeping in mind we talked in 1998, so 18 years ago, we have come a long way since that uh, analysis. But they recommended that less restrictive measures to be used to promote staff training, constant age uh, regarding therapeutic holds, because all the children died during the physical holds, revised staffing models, whether we had enough staff on the inpatient units, Constantly observe all patients in restraints. Airway unobstructed in prone restraints, because a lot of deaths happen in prone restraints. Head to rotate freely in supine restraints. Do not cover the face with towel back, because uh, sometimes children or adolescents or adults spit. So, long time ago, the practice was covering at times the mouth. Discontinue the other kind of uh, mechanical restraints, like neck vest or waist restraints. And sometimes, which I don't know who allowed smoking during the restraint, but that was found to be one of the other things. Uh, so what I will talk about, I have worked in Minnesota in inpatient setting, and one of our papers is related with that. That was about uh, 24 bed units. This uh, experience I will talk and present was my experience because I was chief of psychiatry and medical director for Albert J. Solomon Children's Center which is in Connecticut, affiliated with Yale University. And it has 52 inpatient child and adolescent beds. And about 70 psychiatric residential treatment facility beds, which is level lower than inpatient facility. So I will talk about our experience over about 10 years, uh, what happened in this facility. I joined Albert J. Solomon Children's Center uh, in June of 2007 and left Albert J. Solomon Children's Center in Yale uh, in 2015 when I came to Doha to help the system over here. So I'll talk uh, of my experience for eight years at this place in Connecticut. And I know, I don't know if folks, I know some folks are online from Australia. Some of the folks did visit us, I believe, from Victoria. Uh, and saw our place and have done a lot of work in this regard. Then there are folks uh, who are in touch with us from Sweden, some from Asia, a lot of folks from Europe and of course in the United States and Canada that what we did and how we can replicate some of those things. I already mentioned 52 inpatient beds at our uh, south site is a 70 acre site and it is a level above the tertiary care hospital. So we had eight inpatient units, short term, and the adolescents and children, which they can't manage, came to Solomon Center. So it is like level higher than a tertiary level. We had interdisciplinary teams on every unit, 12 to 13 beds on per unit, which included the males and females, two hallways per unit, and the team included, every team was led by a psychiatrist, child psychiatrist, there was psychologists, social workers, nursing staff, speech, OT. Every unit has a psychiatric fellow from Yale. Uh, and our place is a teaching site for a lot of these different specialties, including child psychiatry, psychology, social work, nursing, rehab, and OT. So why we thought about this and what exactly happened that uh, we and the country thought that we need to make some changes how we use these practices. Uh, I don't know how many of, have, have, of you have seen a Heart for Front uh, award winning series in which they talk about a number of deaths which happen in, uh, around the nation in US and they published this in 1998. But it all started from Andrew McLean who was a 13-year-old boy who died in a prone restraint in Connecticut, just a few miles from the facility where I work. A lot of my staff were working in that facility at that time. So that revolutionized these practices, especially in US, but I know all around the world. 
that a lot of uh, people buy in these restraints, children and adolescents and adults. So that is one of the major reasons. And then I will talk about some of the other reasons which were in our organization and I think uh, worldwide can be the reasons why we need to change these practices. Why are some of the what are the, some of the main issues regarding children and youth? Why we have to avoid or prevent restraint and exclusion? Which is different than in 1998 when the Joint Commission did the survey that we have to do it safely. Now the main thing is that we need to prevent it, not to do it safely. There's very high rate of trauma in uh, children and adolescents who come to inpatient settings. And of course, these interventions can traumatize children and youth even more. They experience vulnerability, neglect and shame and we know there are studies done uh, that a uh, lot of these children and adults have anger or being upset about these strains used uh, a year ago or two years ago. Also something to think about regarding trauma that I have seen a lot of adolescents for example that uh, it uh, re-triggered their PTSD. For example, they start having sleep issues, not sleeping after the use of strain, lights being on. Also, when we apply these procedures, restraint or exclusion, to us, timeline is what is a natural timeline, which might be one minute or five minutes. But for folks who are in these interventions, the time might be one hour, two hour in their uh, brain clock. A lot of times these uh, children and adolescents feel being punished and worsening of PTSD which I already mentioned. What were some of the staff issues which you were considered when you are doing this project in our case that low morale, it feels like that you're coming to a battle zone, that uh, staff getting injured, children getting injured, feeling helpless, what to do, feeling discouraged, feeling of being failed burnout staff, leaving the jobs, injuries, physical and emotional injuries to the staff. So those were some of the main reasons our organization felt that it is important that we work on this issue as a quality improvement project and to improve safety of our children and staff. Uh, I will share some of the stories which are very unfortunate, heart-wrenching. Um, and uh, they are shared uh, nationally in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, Tanner Wilson, nine-year-old, first day of a program, his leg was broken and staff physically restrained. After surgery, he returned to the program with a walker. His leg was later broken a second time. Eighteen months after being admitted, Tanner died while being restrained in a routine physical hold. He died of asphyxiation. He suffocated to death. He was 11 years old. It happened in uh, one of the residential facilities in Iowa. And you can see the picture of uh, Tanner. Eric Campos, 15 year old, suffocated while being held face down after resisting an aid at the Desert Hill Center for Youth and Families. Added offense, refusing to offer hand over an unauthorized personal item. The item was a family photograph. Uh, this happened in Arizona and we know a lot of times uh, when these uh, interventions happen, it happens because of some rules. Gloria Huntley, 31 year old, died in a state institution in US after being kept in restraints for 558 hours during the last two months of her life although she had been diagnosed with asthma and epilepsy. She was nevertheless restrained over and over again because of angry hospitals. Very unfortunate. Um, very powerful, uh, Gail War, age 12. Experience of a mechanical restraint. I hated it. You people need to do better. Time of getting help does not mean you go straight to the restraint bed. You know me better than that. I hate the restraint bed. It makes me think of my past, how some things happened to my mom. You people do not understand that talking about your past can be very hard to do. 
I'm sorry if I hurt any staff, but you all know me. I do not mean to hurt you. These are some of the stories, and there are countless stories like this, uh, which happen in U.S. and around the world, where there are injuries or deaths of children and adult patients in hospital settings, in residential settings, in school settings, in settings. So I'm just giving some examples from uh, mental health settings. Uh, this is very linked with this quality improvement project because since we know restraint and exclusion can cause re-traumatization, it's important that we provide trauma-informed care. And what are some of the main principles of trauma-informed system of care, which I think is an important way and should be the way to provide uh, mental health care to children and adults. Mental health care that is grounded in a thorough understanding of the biological, psychological, and social effects of trauma and violence on children, adolescents, and adults. Knowing the prevalence of trauma experiences in children, adolescents, and adults who receive mental health services. So those are some of the core principles we think about when we think about trauma-informed system of uh, care. What are the systems which are considered uh, not trauma-sensitive? Uh, for example, when we label the adult children or adolescents, for example, that this person is very manipulative, we use a technical jargon like needy, attention seeking, borderline, how we describe the person. So we describe the person of what they're struggling with, and not necessarily that this is a person which has a whole life, and it is a, how we approach a person holistically, because every person has strengths. I actually have, uh, I try to use, uh, like for example, a lot of folks might use the word autistic child. I think the better word is child with autism. Diabetic child, child with diabetes is a better word. So it's not the illness which explains the whole person, it's just one small piece of their life. Misuse or overuse of power, like security, demeanor, restraints being visible, culture of secrecy, that uh, no advocates present, poor monitoring of the system, not sharing data publicly uh, within the system or outside the system with youth and families. So those are some of the things which are considered system which is not trauma-informed. What are some of the other reasons uh, why reduce restraint and screening to be consistent with our mission and vision to promote caring, healing, dignity, autonomy, and respect, which was our vision and mission statement at Solomon Center in Connecticut, to improve the safety of children and our staff, and to avoid causing traumatization and re-traumatization to youth. As you know, change can be very hard um, and you try to change the system, and uh, of course, uh, it panicked a lot of people. And I will talk about uh, six core strategies, which are now considered uh, evidence-based, developed by NASHPED in US, and it is on their website and used federally, uh, which we utilize starting the uh, early 2000s. So what are the six core strategies to you, uh, we use to reduce restraint and exclusion? Number one, what kind of role leadership played in uh, this process? Number two, how we use data to inform our clinical practice? Number three, youth and families involvement, how, we use, how that was uh, involved in improving our practices, workforce development, our staff, prevention tools like before taking or trying to think about reducing or preventing restraint and exclusion, what kind of prevention tools which we try to give to the staff and to the system, and debriefing, how we use our debriefing to make us better. And I will share some of the data, like uh, where we were and where we have come in uh, Connecticut in about 10 years. So this is the uh, data on mechanical restra restraints. So I will talk about mechanical restraint, physical restraint, and exclusion. So mechanical restraint, you know where we might be using a strap on our restraint bed. 
So in our facility, we had about 500 uh, mechanical strains a year, so almost 1.7 a day, every day, in 2005. And uh, we have eliminated mechanical strain. We don't use it anymore in our facility. And it is in four years that no mechanical strain has been used uh, in the facility. I believe the last one was used uh, in August 11, 2011. Other countries, for example, Connecticut is size of Doha, or you can say a province uh, size in other countries. So we have a support from the governor of the state, our DCF commissioner, so a lot of support at a very high level. And then our main leaders, which include director of nursing, medical director, myself, director of operations, they adopted different units. So it means they were involved with the whole hospital, but they were much more present on the unit. So we tried our best not to be in the offices, but to be in front lines with the staff uh, in helping them, role modeling them, what we can do and provide the resources at, at the spot. Daily reviews, a lot of us uh, at the very top level and at the unit level did very re reviews directly. Policies and procedures, for example, if somebody required two restraints in certain time period or if it crosses certain time that they have to call the medical director. So the main reason was that we can provide the resources in we were right away at the spot rather than reviewing the data even in 24 hours. I think that makes a big difference. Unit leadership, which include a psychiatrist, a program manager, a nursing manager, they played a big role. And then our strategic plan of the whole hospital was built around these six core strategies, not just for restraint and exclusion, but for everything. We had an implementation committee, which included vector staff, which played a big role in this. So not just coming from the top, but from the grassroots, how we involved them. It was a standing agenda in our leadership meetings. Uh, we used non-punitive and outcome-based. A lot of times staff feel that they are punished for using this, but we try to use uh, debriefing to improve the practices. And of course, we rewarded excellent practices of staff of the month appreciation notice board. We use particular systems called MAD and TACE and uh, that uh, uh, in that lot of emphasis was given on de-escalation and prevention rather than doing it safely. I remember when I joined the facility and we had these many 500 mechanical restraints a year and people think how are we going to get rid of these? And I think uh, uh, you can't see me, but usually uh, I think it all comes from your heart and brain that you're having a belief that anything is possible. Uh, so I think having a belief and how you instill that in your staff made a big difference, that leadership believing in something, that anything is possible. Because when you think about that numbers, first thought comes to your mind like, how come? There's just no way. So I think having a belief in leadership mind makes a big difference. How we use data to inform our clinical practice, like we develop baseline data, uh, which is by unit, by day, shift, time, what time it happened, what day of the week. So we found, for example, Saturday was the least, uh, the day when it was least used, restrained and school The middle of the day was the most used. We had a school on campus and then the kids ended the school, come back to the unit, it's a transition time of the shifts too. That was a time when most of the restraint and exclusion happened. So we looked at how to navigate the system when we have transition of staff during the shifts. Uh, time spent in restraint and exclusion, for example, if we decrease the total numbers but the time in restraint and exclusion is going up, it means something is wrong. So it means we are just extending the time, but the total number is going. So we try to look at those variables. We also look at the variables if our injuries to staff and children are going up, which was not the case. And also, if you're using chemical restraint or intramuscular injections, 
to replace the uh, physical restraint and solution. So we did the monitor that very carefully. We shared data with staff in real time within 24 hours, not in a week or right at the spot. Uh, we acknowledge successes facility wide. How, so it's not just but we where we use strain and exclusion, but we also share data which was positive data that how many of our children were not involved in restraint and exclusion in a week or in a month, we share that data also. We monitor progress very closely, identifies areas which require training and healthy competition among the units. I think it's extremely important that how we provide the youth and family centered care. Um, it's, it's interesting, I was having this discussion even in Doha, we were talking about uh, like we opening a new facility, how our, our children and family flow should look like. I'm saying like we are talking among our staff, but we don't have any family member to tell that how the system should look like. So it's, I think it's extremely important that we involve family uh, even at the top level. So for example, we had a facility advisory committee uh, which uh, was on, which was giving, con which, which role was to give consultation to the facility leadership and which included the family members and the youth who have experience in going through our facility. We had a youth council who met weekly and who brought the issues to the hospital leadership what to be done or what needed to change. We have welcome things for the new children that uh, that other children on the unit prepared welcome signs to be put on uh, children's door before they come in. They have a welcome basket. Uh, birthday celebration, some kids who have birthdays on our unit we celebrated that. A lot of uh, our children were in state custody, so not very well to do socioeconomically. So we able to have clothing watchers. They brought this stuff in the garbage bags, able to create, have some duffel bags, those kind of things. Of course, children and youth satisfaction service were extremely important to improve ourselves. We didn't have any visiting hours. Our family were visiting were allowed to come any time of the day, they usually call us. If they can't come, we provide gas money to come or other vouchers for cabs or taxis to come. And uh, we value transparency, sharing the data and our values uh, with the families. And empower participation from our families in a lot of things. So in my mind, um, we are not the experts of the children. If you know one child, we just know one child. Families are the experts of the children and should drive uh, the clinical care. We arrange monthly family dinners uh, in our auditorium, monthly family groups. We have different lunch on or which are historical events in US, which might be Martin Luther King Day, Harvest Day, Nouveau Festival. And something which was amazing that one of my child psychiatric fellow who has uh, interest in music, he was looking at the role of uh, music in development and um, he involved, we got some grant involved adolescents at our facility and created an original opera and uh, children sing their songs of their life experiences. And it was so powerful. Uh, for all the staff and the folks who were invited from outside that uh, how it's like for these children to go through this experience. And it was so successful that it was then uh, produced uh, professionally in New Haven. Role of advocates, we have Office of Child uh, Advocate, which is a federally uh, funded agency uh, who have keys to all our uh, hospital units and get access to all of our uh, youth and charge 24 hours days, 365 days a year. So they can access anything, anytime. Um, uh, mandated statewide. We had regular meetings with Office of Child Advocate and I think uh, there are two ways to approach it. You can be defensive or you can look at how the Office of Child Advocate and these regulatory agencies can improve us. Uh, we have active involvement of protection and advocacy, which is another group which did a lot of trainings for our children and adolescents. 
and uh, we gave access to the for our youth to reach out to these agencies whenever they want. Some of the things which we did for workforce development that we our performance evaluations, our annual and midterm involved some of these six core strategies. How we oriented our employees that uh, our goal is prevention and giving education for trauma and DS patient techniques and also talking about experience of staff and how it impacts them uh, trauma wise and creating trauma informed service and system like how we use our language which I mentioned previously about how we choose the words uh, to uh, describe a child with her family and uh, we visited facilities for example Cambridge, Boston have eliminated it before than us and some other facilities and that was a big motivating factor for our staff and and be able to see that it is something which is possible. Staff service played an important part. These are some of the clinical um, trainings uh, which went on along with these six core strategies which I thought, thought played a big part, electrical behavioral therapy, supervisory leadership training, ABCD manual which was manual prepared at our facility so it is uh, mainly created at our place by our staff, kids and families, art model, attachment regulation and competency uh, out of Massachusetts used for trauma and training of clinical staff in trauma focused CBT. Some of the prevention tools uh, we gave uh, families pre-admission visits to our facilities because they were coming from other hospitals so that is our facility we showed them. Uh, the youth which were very complex we sent our teams actually to evaluate the child even before the child comes so we can be prepared for their needs and secondly they know us better and we know the child better before they come to us. We had individual specific treatment plans we designed comfort rooms and sensory intervention, occupational therapy intervention, and child history of trauma. We pay close attention to that. This is actually one of our comfort room, and there were a lot of drawings were done, murals were done by our adolescent and staff together actually on the walls of our different units and comfort rooms where we have occupational therapy materials. Some of the other prevention tools which use building skills emphasis on de-escalation, high hope and creativity. So we have some kids, uh, we have a horseback riding program, clinical reviews, safety plans, Star team is a special team which we created which included staff and backing by physician that they were not in the account when providing clinical care. Their main job was to provide support to the unit which is struggling at any given time and they made a huge difference for us. So these are some of the things which you used, very easy to do and a lot of our children have one page thing in front of the chart which says triggers, early warning signs and strategies used to cope up with the triggers. Uh, some of the guidelines, communication, revision, how we revise the practice. These are some of other uh, prevention to rehabilitation skills. We have a huge swimming pool, music, art, basket, bulk codes welcoming surroundings so we for example uh, this is a huge hallway going to four units it was bare so we added for example some color to it this is one of the units uh, where the mural done by our staff and kids together uh, on the girls unit this was a mural done by our staff and kids together on a boys unit <coughs> sorry boys hallway Going to <coughs> the fifth core strategy, which is the debriefing. We implemented debriefing, both acute debriefing, which happened right at the spot, and the formal rigorous debriefing, which might happen between 24 to 72 hours. And we included youth, staff, and treatment teams in the debriefing process uh, very closely. Non punitive approach, we didn't point fingers. Uh, all the folks who were involved in the event was in 
participate in deep briefing. We look at the triggers, what were the de-escalation strategies tried, what worked, what didn't work, what we learned from it, and what we needed to change in the safety plans uh, for the children and youth, and what kind of environmental and system issues we need to address. What were some of the issues which came up in the debriefing that staff are afraid of repercussions and punishment, may feel ashamed or angry, may have personal trauma history that affects the ability to analyze even objectively the presence of ASAP. So we have a assisted staff uh, action program on the campus to so staff providing support to the staff who have been traumatized at the spot and later on. I think which made a big difference for a lot of our staff was in our field, a lot of our staff too get traumatized physically and emotionally. Some of the debriefing questions we used, uh, for example, for our adolescent, how did we fail to understand what you needed? What upset you the most? What did we do that was helpful? What did we do that caught in the way? What we can do better next time? Is there anything that you would do differently? That is the question for you ask to the youth. What should do something differently next time? What could we have done to make the restraint or hold less hurtful? Uh, I have personally, uh, like uh, we tried at our staff and including myself as, as the chief of secretary medical director, Lying the restraint bed that how these restraints feel on our hands and arms. It's pretty painful. And how the student room might feel. This is on SAMHSA website at US. Uh, our staff and children deconstructed the mechanical restraint beds and made this healing bench out of it, which is a symbol. Uh, for recovery or healing for our children. So a lot of youth who have gone through our facility and have been restrained uh, come and this makes a big difference for them. Some of the future directions like how we do the statewide initiatives, how we have legislative bills uh, that for example in my mind child who might be 12 there is no need for using mechanical restraints for those minds. Some of the standards, at least in US, were created around 1998 and 2000. They are pretty old, so the timelines are different. So for example, one of the timelines for uh, CMS is, or Joint Commission is that every youth has to be available to a physician within one hour if this procedure is implied. In my mind, one hour is a long time. So we changed the time in our place, so it was 15 minutes or 30 minutes. So I think we need to revise uh, regulations in US and I'm not sure how these regulations are implied in other countries and but a lot of those were prepared 15 years ago. So how do we look at that? So some final comments, restraint and exclusion, that we should focus on prevention and trauma-informed care. Lowering the risk of exclusion and restraint used can occur almost every step in the event occurrence. Implement culture change that reduces use of restraint and exclusion, mitigates harm and promotes safety for all. This is uh, actually you can't see the faces because of, uh, of privacy, but these are some of the children at our suite in Connecticut uh, enjoying the swing. And I usually finish by this quote, children learn to care by experiencing good care. This is uh, the place we are at right now, Sidra Medical and Resource Center in Doha. Uh, we are just opening outpatient clinic and this is a hospital for children, 300 bed pediatric and 100 bed OBGYN, not psychiatric but general pediatric. And of course we have a psychiatric uh, arm which will provide all the mental health services for children and families and for women who are pregnant and postpartum. And I want to acknowledge National and Net and Tech, which provide a lot of trainings to us at Solvent Center and around the country in US, staff and with the children and Wish Foundation. So that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for listening. And I'll be happy to take uh, any questions from now on. 
Um, our first question actually came in um, a while ago, so apologies for the, the lack of background. This comes from uh, Regina Uvana, wondering who the staff are that actually restrain the patients. Is it mainly nursing staff or does that vary? So the med and taste training, uh, our CEO to our uh, janitor staff, everybody has to go through the training, that if they have to do it, anybody can be involved with it. Of course, our director staff plays the biggest role, but is everybody was trained? Yes, everybody from CEO to from top to bottom. If they have to do it, they can do it. That answer the question. And I can understand in a lot of places, it's our nursing staff and tech staff who are frontline do it. That was the case in our place too. But a lot of time, even my physicians were involved with this process also. Well, we have um, another question coming in from Murray Patton in New Zealand. Beyond sort of the core strategies that have been developed um, a number of years ago, he was wondering um, what's been done to extend approaches to sensory modulation, which is one of the key elements they found helpful in reducing seclusion and restraint in adult inpatient units in New Zealand, actually almost to zero, um, into community settings. Sure. So to my knowledge, I think uh, there are a lot of folks uh, who have done a lot of work in this and actually that's a whole new training on occupational therapy intervention to reduce restraint and exclusion and aggression. And uh, as you know, most of them were like facilities have comfort room or sensory carts, sensory integration, OT is integral part of it, uh, sensory balls. Um, sensory blankets. So there are a lot of, I think we have come a long way. I'm not expert in OT, but uh, we have OT staff who are integral part of it. Sure. And then um, just following on that, I mean, said he was thinking particularly about the comments around uh, reducing the need to use seclusion and restraint by helping people to develop their own skills to manage stress. Right. How that is exactly right. So. The, so, for example, we look at, for example, not just sensory uh, strategies, but also, for example, when we look at what works for them. So, for example, some say talking by ourselves works. Some says music works. Some says uh, sensory stuff works. Some says somebody talking to me works. And one strategy might work for one person, might be a trigger for other person. So, we, as I mentioned, we did look at uh, triggers and work work and what doesn't work including the sensory strategies. Perfect, thank you. And I know you've spoken a lot about a, a comprehensive strategy to reduce the use of restraints and seclusions, um, which is obviously the goal for what everyone aspires. But I was wondering, for someone who's sort of just beginning to tackle this issue, are there any easy wins or first steps um, where, where people should start their focus? Uh, I think uh, the most important thing is, uh, for example, uh, like usually all six core strategies work hand in hand, but one thing I think was very important that leadership has to be on board, that this should be a um, organization strategic goal that we're going to do it and going to support it. Only just one that thing can make an immediate difference right away. When somebody that this is our vision mission, this is what we're going to do, and rest follows from there. That is probably one of the biggest thing I can think of. Second thing, if somebody says quick win, like at a frontline level, I'll say just having three questions: What are the triggers? Uh, what work and what doesn't work, asking every single chart. And having that one page thing in front of the charts to know just those things so anybody who is walking on you know that what will be helpful for this child when the child is in crisis or the adult patient is in crisis and what will not work. So that is more if I can think of something very quick at the front line but organization wide. Uh, leadership need to take a lead on this and this is what we're going to do it and it is possible to do this. We have um, an additional question from Joshua Simon here from Imperial College who is wondering what your stance is on ECT treatment for aggressive patients who repeatedly require seclusion and restraint. 
to my knowledge, uh, there is no evidence for it. So mainly we use the ECG only, uh, for example, uh, it is found to be very effective if somebody is extremely suicidal with depression or uh, somebody um, really manic uh, in bipolar illness and sometimes medications are not safe in certain situations, for example in pregnancy or somebody don't want picking. But ECT is considered very intrusive and as a last resort, when you fail everything or only in extreme emergencies, but not necessarily for aggression. Great, thank you. And uh, sort of to, to take a quick step back from the specific issue of restraints and seclusion, I wondered if you could just discuss maybe uh, one or two of the, the broader patient safety challenges within mental health and um, your views on that. I think uh, if I have to speak up a few, so for example at our site uh, there were some quality improvement projects. So this is just one of the quality improvement projects uh, we talk about. Second big one is uh, suicide, which I think is a huge issue in mental health. Because a lot of our uh, children, youth and adults attempt or commit suicide. And of course that is probably one of the worst moments for the families and for the staff and what they have to go through and uh, so what kind of preventive measures uh, we can do to prevent suicide. I think that's the second big one I think of in mental health. Third thing which I think at least we work in our facility was uh, medication errors that how we can reduce medication errors uh, in a lot of different ways uh, like with reconciliation or how we use the medication, what are the best practices, I think that's a third important one. Fourth one, I think a uh, lot of time we use interventions which might not have any evidence base and in child psychiatry a lot of things don't have evidence. So how we practice where there is some evidence and data to back up something. So I give you an example. So for example, for depression in adolescents, only two SSRI medications are FDA approved. So we need to have knowledge, unless there's a real contraindication, we pick the medication which has evidence based behind it, rather than choosing something which we think is uh, better or uh, might be uh, like our own preferences. So how we put some things in place which have evidence base. So those are some of the quick things come to my mind. One more question from the audience. This is again from Singapore. Um, it says, our restraint rates have dropped tremendously um, to 1.7 restraints per 1,000 patient days. But their challenge wow. remains staff and patient ratio, which is 1 to 5. Are there any institutions with such staff and patient ratios that can actually achieve um, a zero restraint policy. By the way, Singapore is a beautiful country. I visited there recently and I know they are doing some uh, wonderful work in child psychiatry. There is a child psychiatrist, Daniel Fung, who is doing a lot of work over there. So, so for example, uh, like we are right now preparing uh, practice guidelines for uh, American Academy of Child Psychiatry for inpatient care. And a uh, lot of people rely on American Academy of Child Psychiatry to give some ratio staff to patient. And uh, we have a long discussion on that. Should we say any ratios or not? And we choose not to put numbers to it. The reason being the units are so different and the uh, children, families and patient needs are so different. So for example, if you have one really acute adult who might be psychotic and aggressive, you might need a very different staff ratio versus you might have uh, three adults with depression. So, so we purposefully avoided putting the exact ratio in that practice guidelines. So for example, in our place, the ratio was one to two or one to three. But we have at times children who needed two staff just for themselves that we couldn't manage in our regular milieu. So we were very flexible, but of course that then required resources. And I can understand how you balance the resources versus 
what is the appropriate numbers. So uh, uh, I don't know if I have the exact answer for that, but that is at our place and what we were thinking nationally uh, for children and adolescents. We're running short on time, so sort of just as a, a final question and a way to wrap up. If there were, you know, two or three key takeaways that you'd like to leave the audience with, uh, what would those be? As a child psychiatrist, uh, there are a few things which I tell my trainees, my nurses, staff, and um, the folks I train. Uh, number, not necessarily just regarding restraining syndrome, but generally you know, Number one, first of all, having a belief that anything is possible. I think that's very important. Secondly, families are the experts of their children. We are not. And thirdly, we should be treating people, not necessarily patients. And I tell you a little bit what I meant by that. When we talk about patients, we talk about that there is something wrong with them and we need to fix it. When we talk about people, we talk about lives. And we need to change and help people's lives, not just impacting the illness. So when we, for example, treat depression, the goal should be not just for a person to be less sad, but the goal should be to improve the functioning, whether it's in school, at work. So going beyond, and same goes for medical illnesses, even for diabetes, if you improve blood sugar, the goal is, should not be just to improve the blood sugar. The goal should be to improve people's lives. So those three things I can think of, some of the key things right across my head. Great. Well, I think there's a, a no better note to end on than that. But just wanted to uh, thank you again, Dr. Azeem, for taking the time to speak with us today. Very much appreciate it. And wanted to reiterate your kind offer that if there were any other questions that we didn't get around to, please feel free to submit them to the LHSN team here at lhsn at imperial.ac.uk. And I'm happy to uh, go ahead and forward those on to you. So thank you so much again for joining. And I hope you have a great day.